stuff. We'll probably have to move it over to that side. <laughs> All right. Eventually, get up and go for it. Email to accounting and MIS majors because it's the same thing. They sent it to two majors, but it wasn't MIS that the other. Yeah, they sent it to accounting and a different major, and not MIS. Wow. Well, I'm assuming accounting and finance. But, but I told them, like, make sure you include MIS in it. So how are you guys doing on the Grouping and the uh, project choices and stuff. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. Would it be, like, we have an idea now, but if you want to change it later, for a I mean, that's fine. Uh, ideally, you wouldn't wait until you've done a lot of work to change it. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's uh, yeah, that's fine. It's new. It's not set in stone until you actually start doing the work. What are the presentations going to be? So we don't have a date in our. Um. I would uh, think so. Yes, yeah, sometime towards uh, later on in the semester, uh, probably like after our midterm exam, okay. and we might have like a couple of days to everybody's presentation. So, so that be like late March, early April, somewhere. Yeah. Some, something to that effect, I guess. I'm not sure if it's late March. It could be. Something like that. But, uh, you know, once, I mean, once uh, I get all the groups and all the presentation topics and everything, I will uh, uh, look at the actual dates and set up a schedule so you will know ahead of time what you expect. Right? Good question. Yeah. Hmm? Hi. 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 <laughs> All right, so I guess uh, everybody is here or so. So let's start by discussing uh, last uh, uh, last uh, the previous puzzle that we talked about uh, last time. <coughs> previous puzzle. Uh, so you guys have had some time to think about. Uh, this, uh, what do you think is the solution to this? Yes. Hmm? That is a very common error. It is incorrect. But don't feel bad about it. Yes. Well, you. Why do you say that? Because um, my father's son, because he has no brothers or sisters, would be him, and then this man's father is him. So. It would be his son. Alright, very nice. Everybody heard that? Yes? No? Maybe? Did you buy that? Mm -hmm. Alright, so he has no siblings, right? So my father's son necessarily means himself, right? So whenever you see the phrase my father's son, you can something it in myself. So when you say, uh, this man's father is my father's son, it's the same thing as saying, this man's father is myself. Right? Mm -hmm. So, who is the guy whose father is yourself? If it must be your son. Right? <laughs> okay, just want to make sure everybody are all on the same page here. Okay, uh, so now uh, now that we have uh, we have this under our belt, uh, let me uh, give you a slight modification of this problem to think about. And um, we can take a couple of minutes, and we'll discuss it next week, and we'll go on to talk about uh, uh, what we were discussing. By the way, 
how we can work to draw pictures and diagrams mm -hmm. for these problems if you are a visual type of thinker. Are you guys ready to uh, move along? You think you have uh, a solution to this one? Okay, we'll talk about it next time. And we'll have another exciting puzzle. Okay, so last time uh, we discussed uh, the basics of uh, probability. So let me just uh, run through a uh, uh, brief review and ask you some questions to make sure you remember stuff, right? Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, what is the meaning of uh, independence when you talk about probabilistic events? Anybody remember the idea that we discussed last time? Yeah. 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 That one happening doesn't affect the other one that happening. Yeah. To be precise, it doesn't change the probability of the other event, right? So even if you know that one of them occurred, the probability of the other one is not affected whether you know that or not. Right? And based on that uh, um, framework, we were able to figure out that the joint probability of two independent events is the product of their uh, non-conditional probabilities, right? So uh, then we discussed uh, the idea of a random variable, right? And what is a random variable? Constructed the random variable as a three coin process, right? So, what was the general idea for making a random variable? Well, we just create some kind of an arbitrary rule for aggregating the individual events, right? So, in the case of our discussion last class, we said, well, let's create a random variable that will measure the number of heads in three process, right? And so, using that rule, we get to aggregate the actual events that occur into different bins, right? And so we had one event in the zero heads bin, and we had three events in the one head, two heads, and then we had another one event in the two heads bin, right? And that's just, you know, that's just one of the rules we can create for aggregating the events. We could have a random variable that is, you know, two or more heads occur, right? And that way, the variable would be uh, would be you know, one true, you know, with certain probability, right? And it would be zero, false, with some other probability, right? So that would be a binary random variable that we could try. And we can basically make up any rules we want, right? As long as it is clear as to what events belong to which bin, right? Which events produce which value of a random variable, right? Everybody remember that? Okay. <clears throat> uh, so then uh, we talked uh, a little bit about uh, probability distributions, right? Uh, we uh, discussed uh, uh, the idea of what the probability distribution means for a random variable. Essentially, it's like what is the probability of each that it can take on any particular value, right? And you might remember we talked about the Bernoulli distribution. What is that? Yes. 
And Bernoulli, and Bernoulli distribution is basically you have a binary random variable. You can take on only two values with certain probabilities, right? So it's a very, you know, very simple. And so like a coin toss is an example of something that is distributed as a Bernoulli random variable with probability one half, right? Or, you know, a roll of a die where you're looking to get a one is a Bernoulli random variable with, with distributed with probability one sixth, right? Because getting you one has a one sixth probability. I don't get you know, one or a two. Is a Bernoulli random variable distributed with I mean with probability of what? One thing. Okay, excellent. Have I rather one or a five? Also one. Okay. <laughs> Good stuff. <All> right? <clears throat> uh, so uh, uh, we talked about that. And uh, then uh, we started talking about uh, permutations and combinations. Right? And that was uh, uh, that was, uh, I'm talking about it by way of introducing another very important uh, uh, discrete probability distribution. So let's get back to our discussion of uh, <coughs> permutations and combinations. Okay. And I'm going to go over there to this. Yes, thank you. Thank you, man. So last time uh, we discussed, uh, first of all, we started by talking about factorials. What is a factorial? <coughs> or you guys it's the product of a number and all the number four. Right, so, you know, for, you know, it's the product of all the integers from one to whatever the number is, right? That's the definition of a factorial. And so uh, we discussed uh, the factorials in the context of uh, uh, permutations, right? We could ask a question like, how many different ways can we rearrange some number of objects, right? And so, for example, if we're looking to find how many different ways we can arrange numbers one, two, and three, right? We can say, okay, well, we're essentially in our mind, we're going to be, we're kind of building uh, a decision tree of all the different things we can do, right? So we say for the first for the first position, we have three numbers to choose. For the second position, we have two numbers to choose. And for the third, we remain only one, right? And so at the end, we can count them, or we can just multiply, you know, multiply the number, and we get that there are six possible ways to arrange three numbers, right? Remember, you guys remember that? And so, of course, as it happens, this is three factorial. And we also discussed the uh, you know, a partial factorial, which comes into play when if we want to say how many different ways can we choose k objects out of some larger n objects, right? So again, if we want to choose uh, three numbers from the numbers of one to ten in different in different ways, we'll say, okay, we need to fill you know three bins, and for the first bin we have ten possibilities, and for the next bin, given that we chose something. Have nine, and then for the next one, we have eight, right? And so this is a partial factorial of 10, right? Because essentially it is 10 factorial divided by 7 factorial, right? You can see that, you know, it's 10 times 9 times 8, and the 7 through 1 cancels out with 7 through 1 over here. So it's a convenient way of writing down 10 times 9 times 8. I mean, maybe it's not so convenient when you're dealing with small numbers, but it would be convenient if we were, say, filling in, you know, 20 bins with some numbers, right? And we just say, like, 100 factorial or 80 factorial, right? And that's it. Right? Much more convenient than writing, you know, part of 20 numbers. Okay? Right? So this gives us, the, you know, the number of permutations of 
three objects out of uh, some other uh, you know, general technique out of, out of some other uh, population of objects. Right? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> now the next, qu the next question is, uh, let's imagine that we do not care about the order in which we pick uh, items. Right? So, for example, if we're picking three items out of the three numbers out of ten, we might want to say we don't care if we get, you know, say one to three or three to one. We will consider those as the same sample, right? We don't want to count one to three and three to one as different ways to pick. We want to count, you know, just the unique groupings, regardless of the order. So if that is the question, right, if we want to know how many different unique groupings of three numbers can we pick out of ten, do you think the result would be larger or smaller than the number of unique permutations? Why is that? Are you just making a guess? No, I just don't know if I can put it in words. Okay. Right. Anybody who cares to try to put it into words? Because with, with each combination of numbers, there's so many different ways that you could order them. So that would be your combination, but you can use three numbers to make that. There's no more things. Not bad, it's sensible, yeah. right? The thing is that for each, you know, for each combination, there are multiple permutations. Right? So let's say in this case we have 10 times 9 times 8, right? Which is how much? 74. Right? I'll buy that. Right? So we have 7, 720 different permutations, right? But if we're counting combinations, we know that there are several unique permutations in each one combination, right? So that means if we're counting unique combinations, we're going to have fewer of them because each one encompasses multiple of these 720 permutations. Right? So the question then is, what is the number of different permutations within each unique combination of three numbers? So the question is, how many different ways can you rearrange three numbers? We sort of just talked about it a little while ago, didn't we? Yeah? So? Exactly, right? We were trying to rearrange three numbers, right? In different orderings, we say, well, I can have, I have three different ways to pick the first one, I have two and one, right? So we're back to this, right? And it's uh, six different ways to arrange, you know, a group of three numbers. So, if each combination contains within it six unique permutations, can we figure out how many combinations there are? Yes, right? And how do we figure that out? Excellent, right? So, to find the combination, we find the number of permutations, and then we divide by the number of permutations within each combination, right? So, 720 divided by 6, whatever that happens. Right? So, I mean, you can see that in general what happens is that we can write this in the form of vectorial, right? So the number of permutations is this, you know, this partial vectorial, right? So it would be 10 factorial over 7 factorial. And then we divide it by 3 factorial, which is the number of permutations within each combination, right? And we also, we also divide it by 3 factorial. And so that gives us the number of unique combinations of, uh, uh, that we can do, that we can create by picking three numbers out of the population of 10 numbers. Right? Is uh, everybody with me? Does anyone have any questions? We need to clarify something? <coughs> I have kind of taken several steps and put things together to make sure it is straightforward in your mind. Okay, so if we want to write this down in general form, right, we want to say how many different <clears throat> right, 
say we, ha we, we, have, we have a population of n items, and we want to choose k items out of that population, right? If we want to, if we want to uh, count so that order matters, right? We're counting permutations. Then if we want to figure out how many is that, it will be n factorial over the k factorial, right? Which is what we have right over here. Yes? Now, what if you want to count the number of, uh, it be, right? Now, if you want to count the number of combinations, so that it doesn't matter what the order is, you want to count the unique groupings, right? How do we write this down generically? We say it is n factorial divided by k factorial, that's our permutation, and then we divide it by the number of ways we can rearrange each grouping, each choice grouping, right? And that would be n minus k factorial, right? In that case, there is our, that's our three, right? N minus seven. Right? So that's a, you know that's a, the general the general way to figure out uh, the number of way the number of ways that we can go home. Oh, no wonder. Right? So this is so this is n over n minus k factorial, right? Because remember we're choosing three out of ten, right? We're dividing by seven, so this is n minus k, and then we're dividing by k. But just right. So the permutation is n factorial over n minus k, right? Sorry about that uh, mix-up. Right? And then to find the number of uh, combinations, we also divide by the k. <coughs> right, so this is our general, you know, this is a general uh, general approach to find this, uh, you know, the number of uh, ways to combine some choices. And we could all, I mean, if, we're, if we don't remember, it doesn't matter, you could all just think how it would go and think it through, it's kind of important to understand you know, why that is, right? So I hope you understand, like, each step <coughs> of how we arrive at that result, right? And in, in, in the future, you can only just go and like, look up what this formula is. But the important part is not what is the formula, but you can only look it up. The important part is to understand the logic behind what is going on and why we're doing it the way it is. Right? <clears throat> Any questions so far? Okay. So this is uh, going to come in handy in just a little bit uh, when we start discussing uh, the binomial distribution. <coughs> now, before we do that, let me ask you this question. Uh, you might remember that uh, a couple of classes ago, uh, I'll, I'll be back getting them. Yeah. And so a couple of classes ago, we discussed uh, that I, you know, I proposed to you this game where you could throw a coin, and if it lands on one side, I give you $200, and if it lands on another side, I give you $100. I mean, you give me $100. Right? So you can, you can lose 100 bucks with probability half, and you can gain 200 bucks with probability also half. Right? And I asked you uh, how many of you would like to play this game, and some of you were up for it, and many of you were not. And there is nothing wrong with that, right? Because you have a whole 50% probability of losing 100 bucks, and losing 100 bucks kind of sucks, right? So then I ask you if you would play this game, a hundred rounds of this game with me, right? So with each one of you, if you say, yes, I want to play, we're going to play 100 coin losses, right? <coughs> so first of all, do you remember we discussed the concept of expected value, right? So what was the expected value of a single round of this game? $100. $100. Yeah. 
Wait, what is expected value, right, is the probability weighted average. So we have half chance of getting 200 and a half chance of getting minus 100. So what does it come out? Yes? Not zero either. Somewhere between zero and 100. Okay. <laughs> And how do we find 50, right? You don't have to guess. We know the weighted average is the probability, the, the expected value of the probability times the outcome, right? So it's, it's the sum of the individual probabilities times the outcomes, right? That's the expected value. And so in this case, we have half times minus 100, because you have a 50% chance of losing 100 bucks, plus another half times 200, because you have a 50% chance of winning. And of course, that turns out to be minus 50 plus 100 plus 50. <clears throat> Sounds familiar? Okay. So the expected value of a single round is 50 bucks. Now, if we play 100 independent rounds of this game, what is the expected value of the game? Five thousand, right? Mm -hmm. Not a, not a trick question. Each one is fifty. You get a hundred of them, so you got you get five thousand dollars worth of expected value. Right, but um, so so you know. So if I offer you a hundred rounds of this game to play, it sounds like a pretty attractive proposition. But you might say, well, I'm still I still have a chance of losing money, right? And I still do not like the prospect of losing money. And so even though I, my expected value is 5,000, there's still a possibility that I might lose all the coin losses and lose 10,000 bucks, right? How many of you like losing 10,000 bucks? I didn't think so. <laughs> uh, so I remember somebody uh, last time we discussed said, what if I lose 10,000 bucks? I actually do not, you know, I'm even less, uh, less, uh, inclined to play a hundred rounds of this game than I was to play one round. Because one round, well, I can lose a hundred and I can survive. But if I play a hundred rounds and I lose 10,000 bucks, that would raise up. Right? And so this is uh, where all of this uh, discussion about probabilities and statistics that we've had comes into play. Because I'm going to ask you this question. If we play a hundred rounds of the coin toss game, what is the probability that you will lose ten thousand dollars? <coughs> well, think about it. You know, Dave, you know, don't don't just throw out numbers. Let me give you a hint. You will need a calculator. Uh, think. What is the probability of losing all one hundred tosses yeah, of the game? Power. So, do we have a result? Yeah. Yes. Um, I got 7.8 times 10 to the negative 39. Anybody else? Yeah. We got that? Okay. Right? So, how did we find that? Uh, I did 1 over 2 to the 100. Okay, why did you do 1 half to the 100? Uh, each time you toss it, it's a 1 half chance. So, if you did it twice, it would be 1 half times 1 half. Why would it be 1 half times 1 half? Uh, the first probability is one half, and the second probability <coughs> is one half. So and the two tosses are independent, right? Okay. <laughs> but, right? If the events are not independent, then their joint probability is not just a product of the two probabilities, right? It is a necessary condition that the two events have to be independent so that we can just multiply the probabilities. Right? Yes. That's the same probability you have 
uh, getting the other number, isn't it? Getting the max amount of profit. Yes, it is. Right? You, you, again, you need to get a specific outcome on each, uh, right, on each stock. So the probability of winning twenty thousand dollars is also you know, seven e minus thirty one. Right, so you know, so this is you know, so things are coming together, right? Number one, we know that the tosses are by construction independent, right? Because whatever happens on the first toss doesn't affect our estimate of the probability of what's going to happen on the next one on the next one. And so, given that information, we can do just what we did right now and say, okay, so we have a hundred tosses. Each one has a 50-50 chance of happening. So, what is the probability of getting zero on the first one? One half. Zero on the second one. One half. Third, etc. So we have a hundred of them, they're all independent. So the joint probability of getting all zeros is going to be one half to the hundred, right? So one over two to the one hundred, it happens to be one minus thirty one. Now everybody is familiar with the scientific notation? Do we need to discuss it? Okay, so how many zeros after the decimal point do we get for uh, this number? 30. Okay. Right. Everybody with me? 30? We're good at that? Okay. So let me ask you then. How small is this probability? 7 to the minus 35. Very small. Very, 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 very small. Right? Now, you know, the human mind doesn't really deal very real well with uh, extreme magnitudes like this, right? We kind of work okay with maybe from 0.01 to like maybe a million if we're lucky, right? Anything beyond that just kind of like really large or like really small, right? And if you, you know, read something or uh, discussed something in your anthropology classes or whatever, there are stories of indigenous tribes that only have words for a few numbers, like they go one, two, three, four, and then money, right? So, because, you know, they don't need to like, deal with large numbers, you know, they don't need to deal with anything fancy, so it's like, uh, how many trees are over there? Quite a few, right? <laughs> uh, so, right, so here, you know, the probability of, you know, 70 minus 31, if you're saying, well, that's pretty small, but does it really, I mean, do you feel that it is significantly smaller than, say, 7e minus 25. Maybe probably not. They both seem about, they both are approximately equally really small. Right? We don't have an intuitive sense <clears throat> of just how small that is. Right? So let me give you some uh, sort of uh, examples that might really drive this point home. Right? So the weight of the Earth, this whole planet, is something on the order of 10 to the 27th gram. Right, so it's one with 27 zeros after it. a lot of mass. So if you were to randomly pick, you know, to like pick a gram on of matter in on this planet, so you'd say, like I'll pick this corner of the desk, and then you would say, let me, have, I'll take a random sample and I'll randomly pick some gram of matter on this earth. And what is the probability that it will be my gram? That's right. It will be something on the order of uh, 1e minus 27, right? Because there is uh, 1e 27 grams, and you're randomly picking a gram. So the probability of picking any individual gram is 1 divided by the number of grams, right? So it would be 1e minus 27. Very small. And yet that probability would be about 10,000 times as large as losing all 100 tosses of your point. Right? Because one e minus twenty seven is ten thousand, you know, is one e four times as large as you know something e minus thirty one, right? So this is really, really small. I mean, really, really small, right? If you want, if you wanted to make a fair bet on this, uh, you know, on this event, so that your expected value is zero, right? So the odds of, you know, you would say, I'll give you odds of, you know. 7.831 to 1, right? That it happens. So what is 7E31? Well, the 
GDP of the whole world is somewhere on the order of $50 trillion. Right? How many zeros is that, if we wanted to express it in scientific notation? What's that? 5e to 13. Right, it's going to be 5e 13, right? Because a trillion is 12 zeros and there's 50 of them, so 5e 13 is the world GDP. Uh, now, uh, we'll uh, discuss a little bit about uh, you know, rates of return and time value of money, but uh, let's just uh, suffice it to say that it is approximately uh, reasonable to say that the value of all the Earth's assets is roughly 20 times as large as the world GDP, right? So uh, it would be something on the order of 1E15, the value of the, all of the Earth's assets. So if some aliens were to come down from, from space and start secretly buying up all the assets of the Earth before so nobody notices, right? They would have to spend about 1E15 dollars, right? And still, you know, all of that, you know, the value of the whole <coughs> Earth is not enough to make a fair bet against this probability, right? It will be, it will be approximately, uh, you know, approximately E16 order, 16 orders of magnitude too small, right? You know, the, you know, the value of the whole planet is 1E15, and you need, you know, 1E31. So it's really like basically. This probably is so small that it is fair to say that it will never ever happen. And if all seven billion people on Earth were playing, you know, this hundred rounds of this game for the next one million years, <coughs> right, they would only get you know get out to maybe one e eighteen rounds of the game. <laughs> so when you so if you say what if I lose ten thousand dollars if I play this game a hundred times, you're basically saying. And now that you know what it is, it is never ever happen. Never, ever. Right? It's so close to zero that you can just forget about it. Right? Okay, so it's good to know we don't really have to worry about losing uh, ten thousand dollars. Right? So are we pretty comfortable with that? Okay. So then the question is, okay, well, I may not lose $10,000. I may not lose all 100, uh, 100 rounds. But what if I lose 9,900? Right? Losing 9,900 bucks sucks approximately just as much as losing $10,000, right? So let me ask you this uh, question. What is the probability that if we play 100 rounds of this game, that you're going to lose 99 rounds of them, right? So you'll only win one out of the 100. Take a, take a minute to think about it, how you would approach this problem.
So does anyone have any ideas of how we can approach this question? One over two to the ninety-nine. Now what is one over two to the ninety-nine? All right, that tells you the probability of uh, you know, getting a particular <coughs> outcome out of ninety-nine losses. But here we have a hundred losses, so it's not not quite what we're looking for. Yeah. And you get you just earn plus three Wolfenstein points. Excellent thing. <laughs> oh, these points don't count for anything. Like that. <laughs> Other than the street cred. <laughs> right. So, did everybody hear uh, what uh, the deal was? That was what. Right. So the point is that for any particular sequence of outcomes. It doesn't matter what it is, any particular sequence of outcomes, right? If, let's say, let's, let's talk about sequence of outcomes. Let's imagine that we denote a win as a 1 and a loss as a 0, right? So if we write down a sequence of outcomes, some random sequence might be something like 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, or et cetera, et cetera, right? There'll be 100 numbers here, right? So that's a particular sequence of outcomes. So I win on the first try, I lose on the second, I lose on the third, etc. So what is the probability of this particular sequence of outcomes? Yes, four. Well, exactly. Getting, getting all zeros is one particular sequence of outcomes, right? And it has a probability of one half, and one half, and one half, a hundred times. So it's one half to the hundred, which is 70 minus 31. Now, if we choose any other sequence, it doesn't matter what it is. If it is a particular sequence, the probability of you getting win is one half, probability of losing is one half, etc. So the probability of that particular sequence is also one half to the hundred, right? So then we can ask ourselves a question. How many of these possible sequences will result in only one win out of a hundred? Why is that? How many different ways can you win one out of a hundred? When can you win? You can win in the first position, you can win in the second, you can win in the third, all the way out to 100, right? So there are 100 different unique sequences that can result in us winning only one time out of 100, right? And each of those sequences has a probability of 70 minus 31. And they're all mutually exclusive. So the probability of us landing on one of those sequences is 100 times the probability of each one. Right? Because essentially, by playing this game, we are randomly picking a sequence that is going to occur as a result. And the probability of each one of those is one half to the hundred. So if there is a hundred unique, hundred sequences that will result in us winning only once, that means we can land on any one of those hundred sequences randomly and win only once. And the probability of getting one of those is a hundred times the probability of each one. Right? Makes sense? Is this uh, clear? Does anybody have any questions? Yes. So the answer would be 7.8 times either another 29? Yes, it would be. Okay. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. Like, remember when we find the joint probability of things happening that are independent, we multiply their uh, non-conditional probabilities together. Now, when we when we want to find uh, a conjunction of mutually exclusive events happening, we'll add their probability, right? Just like we say, what is the probability of getting one or two in rolling a die? Well, it's one third probability of getting you one, and another one third probability of getting you two. The probability of getting one or two is one third, which is two thirds, right? 
So similar here, what is the probability of getting a sequence that is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, or 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, or etc., right? So then, what is the probability of getting the, the, the conjunction of those 100 sequences? Well, we just add up the probability of each one. We get the probability of this or that or that happening. Right? Are we clear on that? Is it making sense? Okay. So now the next question I will ask you. So 7e minus 29, how small is that? Very small, yes. <laughs> okay, so it looks like we don't really have to worry about losing 9,900 bucks either. Now, we're not going to work our way through the whole, the whole thing, but let me ask you one more question. What is the probability of winning only two out of 100 bucks? In other words, the probability of losing 9,800 bucks. So you know that in this case, what we need to do is step one is to find the number of unique sequences that will produce two wins out of 100. So we need to find how many different ways can we place two ones into 100 bits. Pretty much with right? So place two ones somewhere along the 100, 100 process. So see if you can, right? So see if you can figure out how many different ways we can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
All right, so how many different uh, sequences produce two wins out of a hundred? All by a factor of two. That's a good try, though. All right. So let's uh, let's see what we have. I mean, let's see how we can apply our thinking about permutations and combinations to this problem. Right. So what are we doing? Right. We're essentially trying to place two ones somewhere among a hundred bins. Right. So we could say, all right, we have. So we basically have two positions to fill, right? So we say, okay, how many, where, I'm choosing the first, where to place the first one, how many different ways can I do that? That's 100, right? Because there's 100 bins. Now, after I place the first one, how many different ways can I place the second one? 99 bins remain for each, for each one. So then we place, we have 99 positions, right? But remember, in this case, order doesn't matter, right? If we place one, if we place a win in position one and a win in position five, or if we place a win in position five and a win in position one, it's the same sequence, right? Because here we're picking the positions of the numbers, and if we look at all the possibilities, you can see that one of the, you know, one, as we enumerate them, one of them would be, for example, you place a one in position one and you place a one in position five. And then as we keep enumerating, at some point later, we'll have another one that says, we we'll place a one in position five, we we'll place a one in position one. Right? So we're double counting every single sequence if we assume that the order matters. Right? Because remember, as we discussed, the list is a permutation. Right? Order matters. But, so, but really, for us, it doesn't matter. Every, every, so every one of these has a clone, a twin, that we're double counting. So, in order to count the number of unique sequences, we have to divide this by two, right? In order to get the number of unique sequences. So, that'll be 9900 over 2, which is 4950. Right? And, of course, uh, if you want to uh, uh, think back to our uh, factorials and stuff, Right? This is, we're looking for combinations where order does not matter, right? So, what this is equal to is 100 factorial uh, over 100 minus 2, which is 98 factorial over 2 factorial, right? And of course, you know, this cancels out with a lot of that, which is 100 times 99 over 2. Right? Yes. Why are we multiplying in like the 1 over 2 to the 100? Oh, we haven't gotten there yet. Oh, okay. All right, so we do now, so now we've said that there are 4950 different ways that we can produce two wins out of 100. So then we say, what is the probability of each one of those sequences happening? And that is 1 half to the 100th, as you mentioned. So the to total probability of us winning only two times out of 100 is going to be 4950 times one half to the one hundred. Right? <clears throat> hmm? 
100 times 99 is 9900 divided by 2 is 49. Right? And the reason we divide by 2 is because we want to eliminate the duplicate combinations. So this is a combination? Right, because we, I mean, the, the way we're placing the ones, it doesn't matter which order we do, right? We do one, you know, win in the first and the second, or win in the second and in the first. It's actually the same sequence, right? So that's why we want to make sure to eliminate the number of permutations within the, each combination. So order does matter? Well, for us it doesn't, right? But in order for that to happen, we have to eliminate the duplicates, right? Because when we do not divide by two, we are assuming that order matters. Now you pick a, you say we pick, pick a one in the first position, and we go through all the different placements for that. Pick a one for the, for the second position. We go through all the different placements for the other one, etc. So that means we're double counting every one, right? Let's say a one and a two, and a two and a one count as two different ones, but we don't want to do that, right? So then we say let's divide it by two so that we count the unique combination. So combination is one order does not matter. Yes. Okay. Yes. If we were looking to fill three slots, we would be dividing by three and so on. All right. I wasn't going to go there, but since you ask, is that a two or a two factor? Two factor. That's not fair. Like well, they were dividing by. Well, here it is a two, right? Mm -hmm. But it is also a two factorial, right? Mm -hmm. Because a two factorial is two. So, the, but the reason we're dividing by two or two by four is because we're saying how many different ways can you rearrange a pair of items? And there's only two. But if, we have, if we're looking for three wins, we would be asking how many different ways can you rearrange three items? And that wouldn't be three, that would be six, right? Okay. So, you can, so now, that you, you know, now that we have this general purpose result, we can answer the question for any number of wins very easily just by calculating the number of outcomes that is produced and multiplying by the probability of each sequence that produces that outcome. Right? So for three, for example, if we really wanted to, why don't we see how that works out, right? It would be 100 factorial times 100 minus 3 factorial, we divide it by, that would be 97 factorial, right? 97 factorial and also a 3 factorial. And whatever that comes out to be uh, is going to be our uh, uh, number of unique sequences that produce three. So what's, what do we have for that? 3.9 times 10 to the negative 27. Well, that, so that, that was for this one, right? Yeah. yeah. So something like 3 minus they were really, really small, right? Uh, how many? Uh, what? You mean this? All right, so we have 49, 50 different ways to produce two wins, right? Each one of those ways has a probability of one half to the hundred. So if we say, what is the probability of getting any of these 4950 ways, it will be 4950 times the probability of each one. Make sense? I just like if you say, if I say, what is the probability of getting a one or a two? We'll say the probability on the on a roll of a dice, right? You'd say, well, the probability of each option is one six, and there are two options that I'm looking for. So the total probability of getting that or that is two times one six, right? So here we're saying we're essentially rolling a 7.8 E31 sided die, right? At, you know, at uh, you know, and the atomic resolution would probably just be a sphere. But <laughs> let's pretend that is the, there is such a thing possible, right? So we're essentially rolling, you know, rolling, you know, a 7.8 E31 sided die and picking one of the possible combinations one of the possible sequences of wins and losses that will occur. And each one of those sequences has a 1 out of 7.8 E31 probability of happening. So if we construct an event that says, you know, that we want to get 49.50 of those random sequences, 
what is the probability of ending up on one of those special 4950 sequences, right? It'll be 4950 times the probability of each side. Just like if I ask you, what is the probability of getting on some four sides of a die, we'd say, oh, there are four sides, each one has probability one six, so that'll be, you know, two thirds, right, or something like that. But it's the same thing, only we have a big giant die with a lot of sides. Make sense? Okay. Anybody else uh, have any questions? Any clarification? Why things are working out the way they are? Yeah. So we're dividing by two because there are two different ways you can do it? Yeah, we're dividing by two in this case because there are two different ways to arrange a pair of items. It could be one, two, or two, one, right? Okay. If we were looking for three wins, we would be dividing by three factorial, which is six, because there are six different ways to arrange three items, right? We have one, two, three, one, three, two, two, three, one, two, one, three, three, two, one, three, one, two, right? That's the six different ways. And all of them count as one unique combination, right? Because they all have a one, a two, and a three. Okay? All right, so you can, so this is it, right? So this is the idea, we can figure out the probability of each possible number of wins we can have out of 100, right? So if we think back to our discussion about uh, the, the tossing point three times, right? We constructed the probability distribution for the count of heads that can occur, right? So this is the same thing, only we're constructing probability distribution not out of just three tosses, but out of 100 tosses, right? And so there are 100 possible values that our random variable can take, right? right? Because we can have zero wins, one win, two wins, all the way up to 100 wins. And each one of those values of the random variable has a certain probability. And we can calculate what each one of those is if we happen to have the information to spend the time. Right? Make sense? And so just as before, we drew a probability distribution for the three tosses, right? We had something like this. So it's one eight, uh, or three eight, three eight, and another one eight, right? For the, you know, uh, zero, one, two, three heads and three tosses. Right? That is the probability. And this is the Remember that? So the same way we can construct the probability distribution for a hundred tosses, right? So we're going to have something like this, it goes from 0 to 100, and we'll have some kind of probabilities for these things happening. Now, as it happens, we can uh, just observe that as the number of items we're picking out of a population of n approaches to about half, the number of combinations that produce it keeps increasing, right? So, since, so, as we're, right, so we know that there is a 100 combination that produce one win. There is 49.50 combination that produce two wins. There is uh, you know, something on the order of, I don't know, probably like 100,000, something on the order of 100,000, 150,000 combinations that produce three wins. And so on and so forth. You can see as we increase the number of uh, wins that we want to place among the 100 wins, the number of those combinations is going to grow. But as we go to more than half, it will start to shrink. Because now, essentially, there are fewer fewer places to place the, the losses. Right? It is a symmetric distribution. So if we draw this probability distribution, what we will end up with is something looking like this. Right? And this is a plot of the uh, probability mass function for the binomial distribution with uh, n equals to 100, the number of uh, samples is 100, and the probability equals to 1. Right? So the binomial distribution we need is defined as the sum of Bernoulli random variables, right? Essentially, we're adding up the outcomes to the number of Bernoulli trials, so the binary 0, 1, and it's certain probability. So in this case, it's a binomial 100, 1 half. Right, so there's 100 uh, Bernoulli trials we're adding, and the probability of each one of those is one half. But we can construct binomial out of any n and any probability. Right? 
Right. So you can see that this point right here is at a probability 7 e minus 31. And that's well, we, you know, well uh, below the pixel resolution of the monitor. So that dot is just going to be at zero, right? Now for visual purposes. And you can see that the probability of getting one win, the next one right here, 7 e minus 29 is still all factors over the zero. And then the resolution of the pixel. So we're basically no, we're basically here at zero until it starts kind of moving up a little bit, right? So they're all positive, non-zero probabilities, right? But they're so small that they're for all of them to perfectly Right? Yeah. Okay. So given this information, we can answer uh, interesting questions. One particularly interesting question would be, what is the probability of losing any money at all? To play a hundred rounds of the game. So in other words, the probability of losing ten thousand plus the probability of losing nine nine hundred plus the probability of losing nine eight hundred, so on and so forth, up until the minimum loss of hundred bucks, right? So, uh, how many? What is the maximum number of wins we can have and still lose some money on this game? Given that our payoffs are one to two, right? So we lose a hundred, we gain at two hundred. Right? So what is the maximum number of wins we can have and still lose money? All right. Exactly, right? If we have thirty-three wins, that means we have sixty-seven losses. Right? And so if we add up our total net result, we will say thirty-three times two hundred is our wins. And 67 times minus 100 is our losses, and we end up with minus 100. Right? So if we have 33 or fewer wins as a result of the game, we're going to lose some money. If we have more than 33 wins, we're going to gain some money. And so as we're thinking, well, what, the, what is the meaning of all this stuff? I want to know what is the probability of losing some money. Right? I know that losing 10,000 is really unlikely. So how do we find that probability? Assuming that we know what all these numbers are. Yeah? You add all the ones up to 33. Or including 33 also. Right. Precisely, right? You add up the probabilities of losing, you know, the, the probabilities of all the outcomes up to losing 33. Right? Because all of those outcomes are mutually exclusive. You cannot win 33 and also win only 30, right? So we can add them up without worrying about any joint probability being in zero, right? They're mutually exclusive. So uh, in general, uh, we can construct the cumulative probability distribution out of looking at uh, the probability mass function. Right? We're essentially look, what is the probability of moving you know, 20 or winning 20 or less? Add up all of these, the probability of winning 25 of us, add up all of these, etc. Right? So the cumulative distribution for at any point is the probability of getting that number or less. Right? So uh, how many of you have uh, at some point taken calculus, basic calculus? Everybody. No? Not everybody? Okay. Uh, so those of you who haven't, you can. Uh, Kind of sit this one out. There's a quick question, although you don't have to. You can actually answer it if you think about it. So I want to look at this graph, right? Look at this uh, the graph of this distribution, and construct a graph of the cumulative distribution for this uh, binomial. Right. So here we're graphing the probability of just getting this number of wins. Now I want to construct the graph which would give you getting that number of wins or less for each point. Right? So in a sense, we're integrating the area under this curve, right, from zero up to that point, and using it as the value for the plot of the cumulative distribution. Right? Do I remember Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, now we will do it, and hopefully you'll get a better understanding of what an integral actually is. 
So you have this thing, how the curve is going to be made. Right, so here, all the way, you know, all the way at zero, the cumulative probability is going to be at zero, right? If you do the zero or the less, at zero, seven to minus thirty one. Right? Um, what is going to be the value of the cumulative distribution here at one hundred? Zero. Pretty much. The cumulative distribution. Yeah. One, right? Because you're saying, what is the probability of getting a hundred wins or less? Which is basically guaranteed to occur, right? You're going to win a hundred wins or less. So the cumulative distribution is going to go from zero to one as we move from left to right. Right? The cumulative distribution is getting that much or less. So now, so the question is, how are we going to get from zero over here to one over there? Right, so you have to think about what is going to be the rate of change of the cumulative distribution as we go uh, from zero to one. I and mean, you don't have to actually add any numbers. Just want you to think about the general shape of the cumulative distribution. All right? So take a minute to think about it. I mean, uh, it's a normal, it's a normal curve, so it's a normal curve like that. Here's the mean, yeah. standard deviation across there. It covers about 66 percent, and then another standard deviation is about 95 percent. Yeah, I think it's just my shape. Actually, yeah, the slope would start out. Kind of, it would start out at zero. It would look just like that, wouldn't it? Well, then it would go negative. You know, it would go like, it would go like that. Yeah. yeah. So if we go to do we have uh, any thoughts? Yes. Uh, it's going to be slow. And it's going to be a lot steeper. And it's just going to go 
All right. Uh, so everybody hear that, right? There, it's going to be basically like an S-shaped curve, all right? Because the rate of change of the cumulative distribution is going to be very small as we start out, right? We just add really small numbers to it. So the cumulative distribution will remain, will remain very little point, right? But as we approach the middle, every step, we're adding bigger and bigger probabilities, right? Until here, at the 30 to 50 point, we're adding the biggest step ever to the change in the distribution, right? And then after, so that, so the curve is going to get over here, right? What's going to happen? Right, so this is the probability, and this is the items, and this is one, and this is zero. Right, so as we start out, it's going to be really close to zero, because every time we're adding a really negligible amount to the probability to the distribution. My but uh, I'm saying here is 50. My but as we start approaching it, we start adding slightly larger amounts to this probability, right? And every time it's slightly larger and slightly larger and slightly larger. So every step is going to be slightly bigger on the way up, right? So we're going to be increasing, sort of like, you know, so, so it looks like an exponential curve until we get to 50, right? And then after 50, we start adding smaller and smaller amounts. It's still going to be going really fast because we're adding pretty large amount. But every step they're going to be smaller and smaller. Right? So now we're going to be looking kind of like this. Until we level off and pretty much at the very end we're going to reach one. Right? After a bunch of really small things. Right? It's like uh, so uh Email? Uh, yeah. Well, like, you can talk to David if you want about how you're trying to get the biases and stuff to the psychological stuff. Like, you feel like doing so. Do okay. Uh, just let me know if anything happens. Alright, I'll ask him what he was. We'll email each other. 